So for a year and nine months, I'm freelancing, but I'm eating lunch in the park because I don't have a job. And I'm working at the Gap while every single night I am applying to every single job on all the job boards, calling people at one o'clock in the morning, trying to get some sort of interview so that at nine o'clock in the morning, my voice and my message is going to be the first one that they hear. So they call me back. I can take my break from folding sweaters at the Gap to call them back because I was determined it was going to happen. And, you know, at the same time, I'm not too good to like full sweaters if that's what I got to do. Welcome to the Passion Behind the Art Show. It's all about diving in with individuals to learn the story behind their passion. It's your host, Daryl Pinna. Well, um, I'm super excited to have Douglas Davis on the Passion Behind the Art Show, uh, educator, creative leader. Uh, author Douglas, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on. Awesome, man. Um, just through your books and just kind of watching your videos. I love this. Um, this is it slaying the dragon? Slay, yeah. Oh yeah. man, that that thing is it's cool, man. It's different, but cool. You know, I appreciate that. You know, I had to try to figure out. You know, when you write a book, you only get so much support from your publisher. And just looking at it just from a business standpoint or the fact that things get old so fast nowadays because things go so fast. We have so many different platforms and things to pay attention to from, you know, tweets or what happened with the White House or like, you know, what's going on in the industry or like some new product comes out. So there's so many things to pay attention to that I was just looking at. How do I make sure that the book is continuously relevant after it's not new anymore? Gotcha. So I thought to myself, well, hey, you know, instead of saying, hey, some generic, hey, buy my book, you know, creatives need to understand business, which is true. I realized that it would be better if I took the concept or subject matter from each chapter and I created a promotional like trailer almost for the book for each chapter instead of the overall thing. So now I have something to say specific to the chapter and it stays fresh. So it's been two plus years and I, I am fortunate and grateful to, to all the who have bought creative strategy in the business of design uh, because maybe they come across me through interviews like you or through my social media presence. I have to say that you know, my highest sales are within the last six months and the book has been out for over two years. So I'm thankful for that. And it probably has to do in large part, you know, with these interviews like this one right here or my conference presentations or, um, you know, some of the promotional things that I've been doing like Slay. Awesome. Cool. Cool. So for all those who've written a book, it may be slow right now, but there's still hope after. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and you have to believe in it. You know, you have to push it. You have to, you know, to get your own uh, book tour together. You have to figure out which conferences are right for your uh, audience. You have to do that. You need to tweet. You have to make sure that you have your own back. And that it that doesn't mean that people are not going to help. That doesn't mean that you're not going to receive any, you know, leads from some other place. But at the end of the day, like, you know, I always like to say, I'm willing to work for everything that I pray for. I like that. I like that. So we kind of jump in the gun, but it's all good. Um, let, let's kind of do your best to go back to the beginning. As yeah. far as you probably can go back, like what made you get into design? Like where did this come from? The whole idea. Yeah. So I'm from Lexington, South Carolina, a very small town, um, maybe about 15 minutes uh, from Columbia, South Carolina. And um, I remember it was uh, maybe just before the 11th grade summer. So just before the summer that I would then become a senior. So I was just finishing 11th grade going into the summer. And I said to myself, you know what, if I don't go to college, I want it to because I, I want it to be because I chose not to go versus because mm-hmm. I can't go. So I had not had one conversation with my guidance counselor about college. 
the only way that I knew about college was my mom had attended uh, Midlands Tech. My aunt and my cousin had gone to South Carolina State. And every time my church took a trip, we would always go to the local black college or the local black historic whatever. Right. So I'm, you know, I'm a high school student. My guidance counselor, for whatever reason, probably by design, had not talked to me or a lot of other, uh, you know, people of color about college. Wow. So I say that to myself. I'm like, you know what? I want to have options, basically. So I take the SAT three times to get the best, you know, the best uh, score. I decide to, you know, go for another math. Uh, in order to you know complete the college requirements, I decide to uh, do my foreign language uh, requirements. So fast forward, I graduate from high school. No applications are filled out, no plans, but I have college requirements. I am volunteering at the Urban League, which was about in, in Columbia. So I stumble onto a conversation about Hampton University because I did not know that the gentleman who I was uh, working with from the Urban League was the vice president of recruitment admissions at Hampton University. So I stumble on, and again, he's not even talking to me. I go into the middle of a conversation where he's like, if you have the college requirements, you should, you should apply. So I go home that night and I tell my mom, hey mom, I'm going to Virginia. I apply. I have the college requirements, I got the SAT, I have the math, I did the foreign language, I get accepted. So I get accepted to what I think is going to be the fashion merchandising program at Hampton University. So my mom packs up all my stuff, we drive six hours north, while I'm unpacking the car, moving into my new dorm, my mom walks around campus one time to see what she's paying for and waves at me on the way out. and. I go to registration and they said the fashion merchandising program had been phased out. So what do I do? I say to myself, well, my fashion interest is rooted in my art interest anyway. It's just a symptom right. of what I'm already into art wise. So I'll do this graphic design thing because, you know, I've never done that before. And that's how I became a designer. It was not deliberate. <laughs> oh man that's kind of crazy because you know usually the usual stories are you know from a child and all this stuff it is just kind of wow interesting so you're telling me that at what you said 11th grade yeah 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 that's when the whole idea of college came to mind that's when the process and this just the idea because I knew that very soon in a year at that point, after, you know, a year in the summer, I would be out of school. And, you know, I think that that I mean, again, I'm just putting this together in my head. But like, I think that's probably where the planning part of me came from, mm. because, again, there was no plans to go to college. I didn't fill out any. I filled out one college application and upstairs wow. framed in my room is my bachelor's degree graphic design from Hampton University. Wow. One. That's just strange because, you know, like, I can just remember, like, growing up in New York, like, you were bombarded. Like, we were going to schools constantly. Yeah. Uh, it's just weird that not even so much that you didn't, but, like, the school didn't. Well, so... I can translate weird into a potential systemic racism. Mm. And I think what, you know, what we could look at there is that there was always a different education at home when you went home than the education that you got at school because of the fact that, you know, these communities down South were used to separate but equal. They were used to boycotting. You know, we, we had to watch uh, eyes on the prize every year. We watched roots every year. You know, in our in our church, there were, you know, and it, it was basically just the center of the black community. And as a result, down south, you had lawyers, you had insurance people, you had teachers, you had janitors, you had the whole spectrum professionally. But that group of people came out of 
the children of the civil rights movement or their parents were the children within Jim Crow or their grandparents were the children who came out of, you know, when things were, you know, people being lynched. And so what I love about that community is that it was so rich and I had a real foundation and, you know, those things were instilled in me at a young age and I didn't have to wait for, you know, learning that stuff or someone else to teach me who was not from my own community to teach me who I was Mm -hmm. at the same time, because those communities didn't have as many resources as a lot of other communities. I look at design and think to myself, again, if I didn't even know what graphic design was, then that means that there always becomes like a group of people who are sort of tasked with planting the seeds of possibility right in at the point of possibility but in certain communities if graphic design is not even known as a viable option your option right. right then you can think about the fact that from the cradle to the grave there's nothing that you can interact with that is not designed nothing not one thing and yet there's still communities that are not aware and so I look at all that and I realize that as much as my community offered me I did need to go outside of the community even be exposed to the thing that pays my mortgage today the thing that you know I'm able to say that I'm an expert in the thing I can write books about or things I globally go and speak about and so I'm hoping that as you know, somebody who participates in the in the field, that I can become somebody who can expose other people to it. And I'll just say one other thing. My mom, I rem- and I can go back even further. I remember going to the fair at uh, the the uh, what is it? What do they call it? The state fair back home. Mm-hmm. You know, a little kid. You know, right. everybody knows. So my cousins took me one year, and I couldn't have been more than about maybe 10 or 12, maybe even 11. So they throw a dart at the balloon, and, you know, you can win prizes. So they won a Garfield mirror. So that (laughs) night I go home, and I, you know, sit down on the floor, and I draw Garfield. And I show my mom when I'm done, and the first thing she asked me was, so you didn't trace that? And I was like, no, ma'am. From there, she, you know, proceeded to give me the art instruction schools. Uh, you know how you could you had to draw the uh, pirate or the. Okay, the, gotcha, gotcha. So I don't know where she got the money from, but like, I was basically going to <laughs> art school at eleven or twelve years old through the mail. When there, you know, when I couldn't afford to actually physically go to art classes, and you know, in that small little town. My high school had an amazing, K through 12, they had an amazing art program. So I will say to those parents who might be listening or to people who have parents who are not necessarily supportive, I want to say to you that if you're a parent of a child who has art in their heart, you should definitely make sure that you don't allow anybody to tell them that they're going to be all broke you know, start an artist. Start of an artist. Because every commercial that you look at, every website that you look at, every app on your phone, the phone interface itself, it's everything designed. that you look at is designed. And just because you don't know about it does not mean that it is, a, is not a viable career option. If you're a person who wants to pursue design, but you're afraid, because your parents expect for you to be an artist, or like not an artist, but they expect for you to be a doctor or a lawyer or something that they understand, you know, because a lot of times they don't, people don't necessarily understand what we do because it's not the normal sort of thing. Right. And so if you're one of those people whose parents are not necessarily as supportive as you would like them or need them to be, don't hold it against them because they are not exposed to what it is that we do. There, you know, we are part of those communities still that design and advertising and creative, you know, professions are not necessarily the things that are on top of people's heads. Right. Especially when your parents might have struggled to get you where you at. They want to see you do well. And so it's because of the fear that you might not be able to take care of yourself that they think you should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer, or maybe even it's because of their own 
dreams that didn't come, come true. Fruition. Not sure, but either way, make sure that you're doing what will work for you. That's going to be a very important thing. And you got to figure out a polite way to help them to believe in what you believe in, but you got to stick with it. That's the whole thing. If they see you flip flopping, then they're going to be like, yeah, of course. I told you stop playing around with crayons. But if you really, really believe in it, go for it. You know, I'm not special. I just, you know, it happened for me because I worked hard and I kept pushing, you know, and this is what I wanted to do because I thought I was going to be a cartoonist after, you know, drawing Garfield. And I wrote from Davis and he wrote me back. Nice. <laughs> encouragement. I'm like, you know, 11, 12 years old and I get a letter from Jim. Day- like it was crazy. Wow. A little thing or, you know, those those little small little things encourage you to keep going. You know, and so just know that whether you're a parent of a child who's who is who has art art in their heart, encourage that, protect them, let them pursue it. And, you know, if you're somebody who's not being supported, there are people who can help you. And if you do stick with it, you can do well. Awesome. Awesome. So you're in you're at Hampton, you graduate from Hampton. So basically you jumped from graduating from Hampton to probably like two or three weeks later writing this awesome book no 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 no. there's a long piece of the story that's in between those two so at hampton uh senior year i'm on a team and we're supposed to be like doing some sort of competition nationally i think it was like mastercard was the client um and i'm the only graduating senior in the group of maybe about six or seven and i tell them up front at the very beginning of the semester, hey guys, I'm graduating and I got a bunch of stuff that I need to do, including my thesis. So I'm going to need this stuff from the competition probably four weeks in advance so that I can manage my time and finish on time and graduate like everything is you know, going well. You Don't you know I get this stuff like a week in advance? So I'm like, you know what? I don't care if you don't care. Because what am I actually going to be able to even do in that amount of time? So we weren't able to enter the competition, and the professor, along with all my teammates, are blaming me. Wow. So the professor says, maybe you should enroll in Pratt Institute. And it was like an insult. Like, you don't have the skills. You should, you know, maybe Mm. do something more. And I said, you know what? Okay. And so I applied to one graduate school. And I got in. That one graduate school was Pratt Institute. Nice. How I got to New York. Because I said to myself, nobody will blame me because of their own laziness again. And so I came to New York uh, after about a year at Pratt. I got my first job in the industry. Now, I didn't have a computer. I walked around New York six out of seven days without a dollar in my pocket. I was spending the night working on my friend's computer at nighttime while she slept so that when she woke up to go to work, I would go home to go to sleep. I was spending the night in all night computer labs doing my work because I didn't have a computer, but that was not going to stop me. So I finally get a job in the, like the internet. I didn't even like it was like at a dot com. I didn't even apply for this job. I was found and hired because of the- <laughs> they found me and they hired me. And so at that point, I had more money than I ever had before. You know, at that time, just in the stroke of like you know twenty four hours. And so I worked there for about a calendar year while I finished up at Pratt. And the dot com recession happened a year to the day that I got that job. So now I got a master's in communication design from Hampton University, sorry, from from Pratt Institute, an undergraduate from Hampton University and BA in graphic design. I got a year experience and the whole economy collapse, the whole design sort of, you know, advertising economy collapses. So for a year and nine months, I'm freelancing, but I'm eating lunch in the park because I don't have a job and I'm working at the Gap while every single night... I am applying to every single job on all the job boards, Mm -hmm. calling people at one o'clock in the morning, 
trying to get some sort of interview so that at nine o'clock in the morning, my voice and my message is going to be the first one that they hear. Mm. So they call me back. I can take my break from folding sweaters at the gap to call them back because I was determined it was going to happen. And, you know, at the same time, I'm not too good to like fold sweaters if that's what I got to do. So, you know, I'm doing all those things and I break into advertising and I'm doing really well. It's so funny that I was hired to, at JWT and I was working on the, uh, the what was it? What, which account was that? Uh, oh, HSBC. But you know what? Let me, let me fill in some blanks. So let me back up. So, so when the economy came back, I went into Condé Nast and I was working there because mm. of the web experience from my very first job. So that went well. Um, I was freelancing in between writing my own, um, you know, contracts and things like that. And that's really what helped me out quite a lot because I had to do everything. Mm. Um, so when I left Condé Nast, I went to Essence Magazine. I was doing work with them for a while in the Essence Music Festival and all the promotions there, which was amazing. And then when I left there, I broke into advertising. And that's when I got a job at JWT working on HSBC. Oh, nice. So going to work every day. And I'm very bored at that point because they didn't necessarily need me to set headlines and stuff like that. But I really love working in advertising. I love the people. I'm hanging out every day with cool people. I'm getting paid more money than I ever got paid before. But I'm doing work that I'm not really interested in. So after about three months, someone runs into the conference room and is like, the client is asking for a website. And I was like, I know how to do that. And at that point, everybody looks at me and then I proceed to tell them how much money we left on the table for the three months that I've been sitting there bored. And literally at that point, I'm now pitching the digital capability for the agency to the president and to the chief creative officer. And I then become the head of the digital arm and I hired my friend for my first job and all that time struggling during the recession, writing my own uh, contracts and working at the Gap and eating lunch in the park while I'm folding sweaters and calling people back on breaks. All of that came into play because I had experience writing contracts. I had experience managing my own business when things was hard. So now I'm on top at this other place and all of that was the very stuff that helped me to actually run that department for 18 months now during that time we were also freelancing on the side at lunch we were like you know freelance and do other things so right. we're freelancing for like e-music we're freelancing for like subway and all these other it was this uh this agency from boston that wanted to have a digital presence in new york so we're full-time at jwt and we're freelancing on the side. One lunchtime, we mess around and we win the Subway digital business at lunchtime. So, like, I was like, oh, snap. Like, now I got a full-time job where I'm the head of a division. And I got the Subway digital business in the other hand. So, the people who work with the Subway digital account, they take us to lunch. Me and my, part, my creative partner. It says, hey, we want you guys to come and be the creative team with us. So what would that take? And the first thing out of my mouth, I'm all of like 25, maybe 26 years old. I said, so they asked me what would it take? I said, I want $100,000 and no boss, literally, like immediately. And they were like, done. So now me and my friend got $100,000 and now we're the top people at this new thing. But now I'm like, oh, my God. I got my full-time job too. So my friend, he just quits immediately the full-time stuff because he's going to this new thing. Cause it was like a $30,000 raise and like title change, all that. So the creative director at the JWT job, he's yelling at me cause he's like, why didn't you tell me he was going to quit and blah, blah, blah. I was like, listen, I brought you my best. And you know, he did what he did because whatever. What are you gonna do? So he asked, he's yelling at me. He's like, Well, what are you gonna do? I said, I want a hundred thousand dollars and no boss. And he starts laughing. And then I already had a hundred thousand dollars and no boss at that point. 
So I gave my resignation. And after two weeks, we were both at this other agency and we were working together at a new place. And so I say all that to say that at some point I started to lose battles because I couldn't really justify what I was proposing in the creative space within the context of the business and the marketing objectives that you know clients were trying to achieve. So as a result, I would fall back on my creative vocabulary that I learned at Hampton, that I learned at Pratt, mm-hmm. that you know, that I learned in you know my jobs when other people were talking about marketing objectives and business objectives and strategy and targeting and segmentation. I didn't know none of that stuff because design school don't teach you business. Right. Right. And so as a result, I then applied to go back to school at NYU for another master's in integrated marketing. Mm. And that's when I learned everything I needed to learn from the business side because I realized that I could be a better creative person if I learned the business part of why we were in the room in the first place. But while I was there, I, I realized that business school doesn't teach you how to inspire designers. So even though we both are professionals, you went to business school, I went to to design school, and we're both on the same team servicing this client, our professional credentials didn't even teach us to talk to each other because business school doesn't teach you how to inspire creatives. And so we lose the account because the client determines that we're not strategic enough or we're not unified or we don't understand his business because we're trying to just make it pretty or we're just solving the business in, but we don't have the design capabilities together because we weren't really taught how to talk to each other. And so that's why I wrote the book, because I saw that there were gaps in design education being taught in a silo. I saw that there were gaps in business education being taught in a silo. And basically, you're in a situation where you're set up to fail, even though you're you have the credentials like that's what makes you professional and yet if you can't talk to your team member because you all are not on the same page in terms of why you're in the room then you know you're going to run up against the wall and so that's why i wrote creative strategy in the business of design and that sort of fills in the timeline from like me at eight years old on the floor drawing garfield and (laughs) you know where i'm at at least right now uh, I mean, it's a very riveting story, man. I mean, just the kind of ups and downs and even the mountain tops. There's still pitfalls in the mountain tops. Right. <laughs> there's, 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 there's pitfalls that the mountain top created. It's, it's, it's funny sometimes how that works. <laughs> so, um, and just to clarify, because like, cause as a New Yorker, like you say, subways, it could be two. You could be talking about two things. You could be talking about the sandwich place. Or you could be talking sandwich. about it. <laughs> no, you <laughs> real? That's real. That's real. Subway sandwich shops. Okay. This is before Jared came out as like a pedophile. You know, <laughs> yo, that whole situation. I had to change my portfolio. I had to pull all that stuff. Oh down. my gosh! Because we had some hot stuff that we did. I was like, yo, Jared touching little girls. I can't. I can't be doing this. I got yo. You got to get out of my portfolio. I can't even be seen with you. So yeah, Subway Sandwich Shop. On that note, I really like the the new logo they have. It's pretty it's pretty clever. Yeah, they pushing. It's <laughs> I think that's so that's that agency. Uh, I think they might be the same, but they were called uh, MMB McCarthy, Mambro, and Bertino. They're out of Boston. Okay. They were trying to come into New York with uh. the digital arm and so they're the ones through the subway story uh you know this is that was that agency okay okay cool cool, yeah. cool. so you've written this book and i'm i'm guessing like everything was just like awesome from there like what first of all did you was this self-published no uh i was actually uh approached in 2012 to help how, you know, how design, how magazine. Um, I was approached to build a course because of my design and business background. They wanted me to write a course on how design, uh, sorry, what was it? How Design University. 
And my course was called Creative Strategy in the Business of Design. So it was like, you know, self, uh, you could go through it at, at your own pace. There were four lessons that you would go through over the course of four weeks. And there were workshop worksheets and like there was back and forth with me. They offered that class nine times. And after the ninth time, they had 17 grand. So I saw, oh, so this is resonating with people. Mm. And then that's when, you know, I was invited to speak at the conferences. And um, so my session was like at eight, eight o'clock in the morning on Friday. And there was a party the night before at 11. So I'm like, nobody's coming. I show up on that Friday morning and there's 600 and 97 people waiting to listen to what I have to say about business and strategy as a creative. That was another indicator that this, I'm not the only person going through this. Right. I'm not the only person. So I did a webinar. They invited me to do a webinar and they said, we've never had the sustained engagement that we had in your webinar. And now we give your webinar to other professionals as the example of how to do great webinars. And then I wrote an article in the magazine that went well. And so then I was invited back to speak again at how. And then like those are the things that over time I saw that the audience that I was serving designers were going through the exact same thing that I was going through back in 2007. And so, you know, fast forward to now, you realize that all those things were still relevant. And so when I, that's, you know, that's how I wrote the book and that's why I wrote the book. They approached me and uh, it was a great honor. It was it was definitely a great honor. I'm, I'm really just very fascinated about the whole just the book process and the book writing and all of that stuff. <clears throat> I was talking to um, David Avery also. And, you know, just I'm just really fascinated, like. What was your process, if just like in just yeah. as as yeah, my process really was to write down everything that I already was teaching, write down everything that had gotten me to where I was because I knew that if I was gonna write a strategy book for designers, I know that like I'm scatterbrained, you know, I know that you know learning strategy at n y u I wanted somebody to shoot me in the face after the first thirty minutes the first class in the first semester, because it was a lot. It was very difficult to go from being a, a pure creative person to somebody who was going to decide to, who didn't have to, I had a master's, I was good. But I realized where things were going, so I chose to go and learn business. But when you do that, you know, again, you have to raise your tolerance for something completely different than the way your brain works. Mm. And so I knew that if I was going to write a book about strategy, my audience being designers, very short attention spans, visual people, but I'm going to talk to them about strategy. <laughs> I knew that I had to write down my story to be very clear that I'm a creative. I'm a creative, number one. All right. Period. That's who I am. What I do and what I've learned is that to survive based on the way things are evolving, I had to become the creative who understands strategy. strategy. I had to approach my job as a strategist, period. And so as a result, those things became philosophy. Mm, and, you know, I was in classes the whole time as well. So I was already doing everything that I then started to write down. Or I learned it at NYU, or I learned it on the job somewhere. And so I just wrote down everything that I was already doing. And since, you know, I literally had the idea one day, hey, I'm going to write a book proposal. You know, I'm not a writer. And so I write the book proposal because I see that there's an audience of people who want the content that I'm talking about because they're going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a writer. And so I hired a freelance editor so that I could be comfortable with my own quality way before I was supposed to turn in the manuscript to my to my publisher. So I was already happy with what the product was. I had already gone through the exercise of storytelling on my own, you know. And so if there's any advice that I can give in terms of process, it's really about making sure that you know what you think before you're asked what you think. That's very important first. 
But I think, you know, then you also have to recognize that your experience and what you're going through is valuable. That's from your perspective. And you're qualified because if you can articulate the larger like insights that come from the things that you've gone through, then that's what makes you qualified. The fact that you can articulate what it is that people should take away from whatever it is that you know, you're know you doing. And so being someone who can actually articulate those things, flesh those things out, you know, my process was to make sure that I was happy with the way I tell stories. So if you think about back in 1999 when I got my first job in the internet, you know, at the dot com, that was back whenever you could actually say, you know, as a designer, do you want to learn the web? It was it was like, hey, I could do whatever I want to do, you know, right. but the recession happened. Right. So after the recession happens, what was the question after that? Well, what type of designer are you a web designer or a print designer? That's that's a subtle change, but that's a big shift. Big, it's a big shift, that's a big shift. And then from there it became Okay, so after a while, you could make the choice whether you wanted to learn or not, but at the end of the day, there were more jobs and more jobs and more jobs that required it. So the people who held out and said, no, I don't want to learn that new thing, their revenue started going down and they realized they couldn't keep sustaining practicing doing the exact same thing without learning something new and without learning specifically code at that point. So what I'm saying to you and to the audience, and I know this is about process, but I think it's going to be really important for people to choose to change before you don't have a choice. Because now we're at the point where strategy is what web design was back then. Now, in 99, you couldn't go to school for web design. That did not exist, right. even though we were in the middle of the largest economy expansion because of the Internet. Think about that. It was just about the skills itself. It wasn't about where you went to school. It was about the skills. So if you had the skills, you could work in work. You could work. And and so it's the same thing now. And so in terms of process, I handled writing the book like I handled moving into the digital space. I did it before while I had a choice. I chose to do it. Just like I handled going back to school. I chose to go back to school. I didn't have to do none of those things. But because I did those things, I was able to continue to reinvent myself as the profession changed. Right. So that when it changed to the point where you don't have a choice, if you don't learn this or if you don't know how to do this, you can't work at all. I was cool with that and I'm not afraid of changes because I go and find the fear. I'm hunting the fear instead of moving away from the fear. I was terrible at typography. And so I said, I'm only going to use typography because this is a weakness and I'm going to make it a strength. Mm. I've always been the person to go into the fear instead of run away from it. And so that's why when they accepted my book proposal, even though I was like, I'm not a writer, I was like, I'm about to write a book. <laughs> serious about this. I know what I'm talking about. So let me go through the same process that I would if I was designing something. And I'm really happy with the results and I'm thankful that it's helped a lot of people. And so I'm just hoping that, you know, some of your listeners are people who are going to choose to learn strategy now because we're at that point now. Where it's needed. You have it, to. <laughs> it's not a choice anymore. It's not a choice anymore, fam. And so, you know, just you always gotta be looking down the road, you know? You right. always gotta be looking down the road and paying attention. You know, right. it's very important. So in that vein, what would you say was the hardest struggle you had to overcome? Yeah. Well, I was a blackout drinker when I left at 17 to go to Hampton. And so one of the hardest struggles for me was the substance abuse. Mm. And that only got worse and worse when I got to New York because I had broken the advertising and, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon, your agency becomes a bar or you're drinking at your desk because you got the account of these alcohol brands. And it's not weird because that's what you do in advertising. And so that type of work, 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 work. And then 
you send the work off to the client and so you're basically waiting and so you drink 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 and then when the client sends the comments back you work 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 there was this sort of cycle of binging and working and binging and working and so i got to a point where i didn't even throw up anymore i just blacked out and so mm. i could still work i would still function i would still do whatever but i couldn't remember past a certain point and so biggest struggle has been to overcome my alcoholism wow and it's been since 2001 that i've been sober and i haven't you know drank or smoked anything since then and i'm thankful that even when i was a young person that i realized that i never really used my gift high or drunk because my grandma and my family would always say that you have a, the gift of art and as a result of seeing it as special as a gift I never mixed, even though I had a terrible drinking problem, even though, you know, I'm smoking and I can't stop and we're getting high all the time. Like, I never once got high or got drunk and used my gift, never once. And I'm so thankful for that. Mm. And because take it so seriously, that seriousness helped me, even though I was on the top and bottom at the same time, my personal life was a complete shambles because of my habit. And yet I was still excelling because of my work ethic and the seriousness that I viewed my gift with. So overcoming that was the hardest thing. Man, wow. Wow. So who would you say is some of the people that, you know, back then or even now that, you know, you would say is your support circle helped you get through that? You know what I mean? Yeah, my church was was definitely a, a big, big support um, because I realized that instead of being hypocrites and saying, hey, you're a sinner, get out of here, they were like, hey, you're a sinner, come into here, and we have this program for people who have problems with alcoholism. And so I had a huge support system in New York City. My family was always supportive. And, uh, you know, I'm just really blessed and grateful that I did have that support because, again, it was very difficult, you know, being here and the the stress and pressure of can I compete? Can I survive right. here? Right. And yet at the same time being in an industry where drinking and being drunk and, you know, working all the time is not weird. That's just normal. You know, Mad Men was not based on a myth. Right. Uh, so it's a real uh, thing. <laughs> people don't understand that. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's a normal thing. And, you know, just, I would say to people to take care of themselves, you know, it is one of those things where as designers we're up all night, you know, we're working hard and mm-hmm. you know, you can you can really hurt your health like that. You can really put yourself in a situation where you can definitely get the deadline done. But I remember, you know, being at Pratt and working at Juno, which is where I was at the dot com, my nose would bleed three times a day. Wow. I know wow. they thought I was doing Coke because I was under so much pressure and stress and I was drinking and I was smoking and I was performing very high on a really high level. And, you know, the work was amazing. And that's why very young I got these positions of responsibility. But I was really running my health in the ground. And I'm just really grateful that, you know, I'm, you know, I'm clean and sober um, because the work continued consistently getting better. And I just recently, you know, from 2001, have been able to, you know, really focus on the fact that if I'm not here to do the work, then that defeats the whole purpose, you know, if my health is not good. So I would say to people, figure out a way that works with your health, you know, not compromising it. Man, that's so true, though. Like, for some reason, we designers, we don't really take care of bodies and we don't not, <laughs> it's tough man you know because a lot of times you know the only time i can actually focus is maybe at 12 o'clock to like 6 a.m you know right and that's when you just get it done that's just rock out zone. turn off the music <laughs> get in that zone and it's like bang 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 you know and so it's it's hard it's a lifestyle it is a lifestyle but it's very difficult um and people don't really understand that and so it's good that you or, you know, having that we're having this conversation to bring these things to light because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, your health is very valuable, more valuable than the most things. Right. And right. yet 
being able to make sure that you move forward in your career and be the best that you can be, especially when you're competing on this level, you know, that day, that there's no other way, you know, forward in that way either. Right. So right. I don't know what the balance is for everybody, but, you know, it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work. And you have to figure out how to balance things out. So for me, it was, you know, going to Maryland from New York when I was, you know, in school, I needed to like go visit my family in Maryland or go visit my family in DC or go visit my family in South Carolina. Like that needed to happen like every so by the time I came to New York, it was like, you know, a couple months. At Hampton, it was like every month, every couple wow. weeks. You know, because I my 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 community back home was just so strong and rich and I was rooted in that. And so I, you know, it was very important that I was continuously, you know, rooted and connected. So figure out what gets you through and it'll be different for everybody. Right. You know. Nice. So what is the first hour of um, Douglas Day like currently? Currently, it's uh, burping my son. We had a newborn maybe about, uh, you know, about nine, ten weeks ago. Congrats. Thank you. Jonathan Brandon Davis is his name. And uh, he likes to start crying at about 2 a.m. And uh, so we have to turn on the vacuum cleaner at 2 a.m., and so it's, uh, you know, we, we have a little bit of a lack of sleep. And so my day starts with, you know, burping my son and, and having a good time with him before it's time to get on some calls or, um, you know, just figure out what, what the day is going to hold. Nice. And, uh, I'm always doing a lot of hustling. Actually, earlier today, I was at Stephen Heller's uh, MFA design class. He invited me to speak to that, to them. Nice. With this the designer as entrepreneur uh, program there at SVA, and so I was able to go in there and give them insights about you know how to transition this work into you know running the business of yourself, because you know as I told them Pratt didn't teach me, you know Pratt didn't prepare me to get a job. Pratt prepared me for a time when there were no jobs. Mm. So it's very important for all of us to to become comfortable with writing those proposals. Now, again, I did it out of necessity. There, were, The industry had disappeared because of the dot-com right. recession. So I did what I had to do using my skills. But, you know, again, some part of a theme in this conversation has to be, you know, let me figure out how to create a job instead of looking for somebody to give me one. You know, let, let me make sure that I'm comfortable, whether it's writing my own, you know, job responsibilities in a proposal and then choosing my own team and coworkers and managing that myself or whether it's doing that same thing in the job context. You know, how you want it. I can do it front and back. I can do it however you want it. So for me, that's normal. You know, I just, it, I became more comfortable being on my own. Right. And so, it, again, this, go, this journey is going to be different for everybody. But, you know, I would urge designers out there to make sure that, you figure out a way through a lot of investment and grinding and stuff like that, real pipeline and, and, and just planning, figure out a way to work around, around your life instead of live around work. That It takes a while. It takes a while. But I can definitely say that, you know, we own a, a, a duplex that's larger than most people's apartments and in New York City, I could probably fit a good like four people's apartments in my home that we own. Nice. And so I'm thankful for that. I'm very grateful. And, and again, it's been 20 years since I got here. And that, you know, it's been a lot of ups and downs, as you mentioned earlier. But I've consistently put in the work. I've been grinding. I, I, I have a lot to show for the time because I have not been sitting around, you know, waiting for somebody to give me something. I've figured out how to keep working and grinding and, and, and sharpening my knives and learning new things. And, you know, I've chosen to grow in my own skill set versus just waiting for the end of the way that things are now. I've looked at, you know, what is next and figured out how to write articles and, and become somewhat of a thought leader because I know what I think before I'm asked what I think. So now when people ask me what I think, like Stephen Heller, 
come into my you know graduate class, I know exactly what I'm going to say because it's you know it's it's what I do every day. Nice, nice. Yeah. I like that. So, what's next for Douglas? What's next? What next for me? That's a good question. Um, in next year, I accepted a uh, a an invitation to to go to China. That's like my third invitation to China, but it's the first one that that I've accepted. Uh, Beijing Normal University is going to have me out there. I'm going to do a workshop for them and see the Great Wall and do a couple things that I've been wanting to do out there. Um, I think the next thing I hope is that I'll be promoted. I uh, I, I put in a promotion application. Nice. I'm a person at my department at New York City College of Technology. So I uh, I teach there, but I'm also the chair now in the communication design department there. We have a BFA program that just got accredited. So we've been doing some big things, but um, in academia, until you change your title, you get more responsibility, but you don't get any more money. So I put in my application there and really I'm just looking to figure out how to make sure that my son has some of the same opportunities that I did. Um, nice. by making sure that we expose him to art and that we're able to, you know, you know, have the resources to do that comfortably to, to make sure that he can be, you know, he can have the choices that, that I didn't have or that a lot of people didn't have because maybe they didn't have the resources. So that's, that's really what's next. I'm really, you know, my life stage has changed now. Right. And so as a result, my responsibilities and my focus is sort of shifting as well. But I'm always working on something. I just did uh, directed a documentary, uh, produced a documentary on Tony Despina. Okay. Okay. That we're going to shop around to some film festivals. I can send you the link, actually, um, so that you can post it within this uh Maybe maybe I got to talk to the director just to see whether we're ready to post, but I'll at least send it to you okay. so that you can look at it. Sounds um, good. But yeah, like a lot of what I'm doing now is just to continue telling stories in a whole bunch of different, um, you know, different channels and things like that, man. So I'm always making moves and uh, I'm just trying to make sure that, you know, my son can see me as someone who is the chair of a hundred adjuncts and faculty members and 900 students. And, you know, I think it's just really important to see black role models. And it's, it's crazy because I didn't have one black design professor at Hampton university. And then when I went to Pratt, I did not have one black design professor at Pratt hmm. and I went, you know, continuing education at SVA and I went to NYU. I did not have one black strategy or design professor at SVA or at NYU. And then I became a design professor. Mm. So I, I want to always make sure that my son can see what is possible because I did the best that I could do. Even if he doesn't follow my footsteps. Right. You know, I, I want him to have the ability to have a choice. And again, the only way that that can happen is if I am successful enough to make sure that we have the resources that he could choose what he want to do. Do what he want to do, right? Back to the same thing I was talking about earlier with parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, man, love yeah. it, man, love it, love it. Enjoy. So where can and people go to learn more about what you're doing? They can go to thinkhowtheythink.com. That's my website. And uh, that's where I post uh, all the you know different lectures that I'm doing or wherever I'm going. And if I was on a podcast, uh, I always post that stuff in my blog. But uh, I'm definitely active um, in IG. Uh, you know, so if somebody wants to see what's happening in IG, I'm at D Q U E J U A N in Instagram, and I can email that to you. Or I'm Professor Davis in Facebook. Um, as well as real life, but uh, also on Twitter, I'm at Douglas Q Davis. So, you know, get at me. Sounds good, man. Well, Douglas, I really appreciate you taking the time out to do this. Um, really appreciate it, man. Thanks for Absolutely. coming on. Um, thanks for all the insight. Just thanks for just being super transparent and sharing 
a lot. Really appreciate it, man. Yeah, no problem, man. I hope that it helps somebody, you know. And again, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it, too. Be safe. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. I really appreciate you taking the time out. I hope, you know, you got something from it that it brought you value and, you know, you were able to pull something, some key tips, some key practices that can help you to take your career to the next level and just to elevate your mindset in general. Um, If you want to learn about everything that I'm doing, you can go to dpcreates.com. That's D as in dog, P as in Peter, creates. Dot com or go to the podcast website that's passion behind the art dot com. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode. Be blessed. <laughs>